Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm telling you what, saints. We living in the last days. I was done with this. Uh, and as I walked away and, you know, I'm uploading part one, I usually mark it private and I'll release it later tonight for, for Sunday. Let me see. Matter of fact, what percent it's at? It's already 25%. God said, come back. I said, you ain't done. See, look, here's the thing. It's no longer business as usual. Fight on part two, October 7th, 2012 at 1.20 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. It's Minister Paul in Northern California. And um, we have an enemy. God, God, God turned me around from my office, had me come back here. Uh, don't eat for nothing. Green tea, no, no breakfast, no lunch. And finish the message. That's obedience. That's how we got to walk today. Another hour. Part two. You know why? I'm not promised tomorrow. I'm not promised to do a Wednesday message. I don't have to do messages on the earthquakes or World War Three or, or the elections or the Antichrist. Those, all I got to do is refer you back to visions and, and dreams and word and knowledge and prophecies God has given me. Since last year, they're already out there. God hasn't given me a new word. I ain't going to manifest one. I'm going to stick to his word. So uh, that's why you don't see me doing like three videos a day unless the Lord tells me to. If he gives me a new word. But there's no sense in me in making a World War Three video when I already have three dreams of it. There's no sense in me being taken into custody and warning you about these detention centers. You know what I mean? I've already done that. Uh, if God gives me a fresh new word, you can best bet I'll make as many videos and say everything that he tells me to say. It's just like just now. I have never done a two-part Sunday series. But God said, well, you are today. See, I'm listening to God. Do you think the devil would tell me to come back here? Think about this. Because I know that I have critics and enemies. And, and so if you're watching this, I'm going to let you in on a big secret. It doesn't matter who you are that's watching this. You have enemies too. To think you don't, it would be a lie. You'd be deceiving yourself only. You wouldn't be deceiving God. You wouldn't be deceiving your friends. You wouldn't be deceiving the devil. The only person you'd be deceiving if you thought you didn't have any friends, no matter who you are in this world, if you're a human being, you have enemies. So, you got to fight on in your own way. You got to fight on. Otherwise, this world going to swallow you up. And so God said to tell them, look, they have enemies. Fight on. So let's go back to this uh, second. Uh, the, the, talking about Peter. Um, they, they actually know where he was crucified in the side of his crucifixion. Um, I'm just going to give you a little background on Peter. Uh, his original name was Shimon or Simeon. Uh, in modern English, it's Simon, like Simon says, S-I-M-O-N. He was later given the name Peter, a name, drive, name derived from Petrus, which is a masculinized form of the feminine Latin word Petra, which means rock. That's where they get the word petroleum. Uh, for what concerns Greek, uh, Petra, and even in Latin, the English and German Peter and French Pierre and the Italian Pietro and the Spanish Portuguese Pedro, Polish and Russian Pietar are all derived from Petrus, the rock. Isn't that amazing? Even in Aramaic, the rock. So uh, you can find... I, I, God just has me focusing on Peter today because he was a fighter. He fought on. And he didn't live a perfect life, but he made it to heaven. And, and that gives me hope. And so what I want to do is transfer that hope to you. Uh, you can read about Peter in the in the four Gospels. And you can read them in the, in the book of Acts. Um, uh, just some... Quick facts. It says, uh, Peter is among the first of the disciples called during Jesus' ministry. It was during his first meeting with Jesus that Jesus named him Peter, or the rock. 
Peter was to become the first apostle ordained by Jesus in the early church. Peter ran a fishing business in Bethsaida. He was named Simon, son of Jonah, or John. The Synoptic Gospels recount how Peter's mother-in-law was healed by Jesus at their home in Capernaum, which coupled with 1 Corinthians 9, 5 clearly depict Peter as married or a widower because it was his mother-in-law. Isn't that fascinating? So he he was either married or a widow. So just want I want I want this to become not just a story to you, but that Peter was a real person who faced real battles and real trials and overcame them all unto his very last breath, crying out, "Jesus is Lord." He was a fisherman with his brother Andrew, and the sons of Zebedee, James and John. The Gospel of John depicts Peter fishing too. Even after the resurrection of Jesus, when they catch 153 fish, and there's there's a whole story in that hundred. Why 153 fish? That's homework for you. In Matthew and Mark, Jesus called Simon and his brother Andrew to quote be fishers of men. In Luke, Simon Peter owns the boat that Jesus uses to preach to the multitudes. Isn't that fascinating? Uh, Jesus then amazes Simon and his companions, James and John, and notice that Andrew isn't his, mentioned his brother, by telling them to lower their nets, whereupon they catch a huge number of fish. Their nets were going to break. Remember that story? This Peter. Jesus loved them. Jesus loved them. And Jesus loves me, and Jesus loves you. And we got to come against some of this hatred and just stop it, man. Okay, so in, in, if you go to the Gospel of John, it will give a, a comparable account where uh, it was two disciples of John the Baptist, Andrew and an unnamed disciple. Remember, Andrew is his brother. They'd heard John the Baptist announce Jesus as Lamb of God. Remember when John the Baptist goes, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And they followed Jesus. Most people believe that that was Andrew and Peter. And then uh, Andrew then went and fetched his brother Simon, saying, We have found the Messiah. And then they brought Simon to Jesus. And then Matthew 16, really, man, you should read Matthew 16. Uh, that's when he was saying, Who do the people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? He says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, You're blessed. You're blessed because of that. And this Peter, he, he goes on later to uh, be told that he gets rebuked by Jesus. He, he's told that he has little faith. He's told that, why do you doubt? He said, you're going to deny me three times. To me, Peter is just an example of the ultimate forgiven sinner. That's why I relate to him so much. A lot of people talk about the Apostle Paul, a wretched man that I am. Among sinners, I was chief, but man, but to deny Jesus three times and still be forgiven. So here he is now. He's full of the Holy Ghost and he's forgiven. I just want forgiveness. If I say anything today, because I'm not guaranteed next week. These people, look, it, it, go ahead and do whatever it is you want to do. Anything that you've done to me up to this point, I forgive you. Anything you do to me in the future, I will forgive you. But uh, I, I don't think we should be fighting each other, honestly. I think it should be about Jesus. I think everything we do, all of us, together, is to make it about Jesus. These are the last days. Man, I'm doing a part two. I'm going to upload. I don't know how long this will run. But uh, this I'm making a part two for the first time ever. You know, as I was sitting right there, I looked up through that window. I'll show you. I'll give you an I sit right here at night. And then I look up. You see how I can see out that, that window right there that's open? I saw like a UFO type white orb flying right towards me. 
Now, my normal reaction would be get up to, to film it. And I'm like, man, I'm tired of filming these things. If you don't believe they're flying around, there's one that hovers right above the school now. It's huge. It's like a little, try to give it, it it's the size of about 20 bright stars. Picture a bright star. It's the size of about 20 of those. It just sits there and hovers above the school. If you don't believe me, you know I'm a proof producer. I'll produce proofs of that. I don't know, is it a jet from Beale? I don't know what it is. I don't know what that thing is. But literally, I'm sitting here. I've got to relax. My wife had to be up at 3.30 in the morning. And I had set my alarm up to see her off at 3.30 in the morning. I'm laying there. It's almost midnight. And I'm about ready to just only get three and a half hours sleep. And this thing flies right at me. I mean, come on. Something's happening in the world. You have to admit I don't care who you are, saved or unsaved, you have to admit, with all the video YouTube's providing, that something really is happening in the world, and it's lining up with the Word of God. So what type of people should we be if we know that the one who holds our eternal destiny and future in his hands is, is returning? Jesus is returning. It says he's going to return. It doesn't matter whether you believe in the rapture or pre-trib or mid-trib or post-trib. Either way, Jesus is going to return. And, and if, if it doesn't happen in your lifetime, that means you're going to have to face death. Either way, you're going to have to face him. Whether it be after your physical death, or whether it be when he returns, whether, whether you believe in he does it before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, three and a half years into it, whether you believe the tribulation's already started, whether you believe the tribulation ending is irrelevant, you are going to have to face Jesus. And what he's going to look at is what's in your heart. Is there unforgiveness in your heart? Is there bitterness in your heart? Is there hatred in your heart? Is there fornication and adultery and adultery in your heart? Well, then, according to the Word of God, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. That should really give you a fear of God, a reverential fear and respect to do what? Get it right today. Do you, you don't think that, follow me on this, because let's get back to this message. I forgive you. Matter of fact, this is a lot. help me, Lord Jesus. I, I pray that this is, I pray, honestly, today my prayer it's 10-7-2012 at 1.31 p.m. My prayer is that this issue between these people who wrote the book and follow this book and myself is over once and for all. That I forgive you. You accept my forgiveness like the Bible commands you, not suggests. Commands you to forgive. It, it commands you to forgive. I'm waiting to hear from my wife. Good news. Um, you're commanded to forgive me, to pray for me, and to love me. And I'm commanded to forgive you, to pray for you, and love you, even if I consider you my enemy. That's real. So are we going to do that? I am. So now I've done my part. So now I turn it over to God so I can continue on with my ministry and just let it go because we can't keep bringing this up. Because I mean, that's what the devil wants. Do you think Jesus wants us here just arguing back and forth or putting out his message that he's coming back? So we ended off. So that's a done deal. You're forgiven. You're forgiven by me. Now, whatever is left is between uh, God. And that will be handled uh, uh, at, at, at judgment. Honestly, I'm done with it. Pray that I don't bring it up again. If I come under such attack, I don't want to say that. That's thinking negative. Please forgive me. Whatever I've said or done that has you so offended and angry at me, forgive me. I, this is like the third time I've asked that. Stop attacking me. Please. The third time I've asked you that publicly. You're hindering this ministry. Stop harassing and attacking me. I forgive you. Please. Whatever is got you upset it's over with let it go ok 
Okay, so we ended off and first we talked about who Peter is. He denied Jesus three times. Jesus forgave him anyway. And then he says we'd we'd ended off with 16, 1 Peter 1, 16. It says, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. How many people know the only way you're going to be holy is with the Holy Spirit in you? <laughs> There's no way you can be holy in your own strength. There's no way you can be righteous in your own. Isaiah 54, 17 says Cause with that this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, see, say it the Lord. Who said it? Who said it? The Lord. What are we righteous? Why are we righteous? Because of him. Who said it? The Lord. Said what? We're righteous. What? Okay. Said we, and Jesus said, I got to go so that the Holy Spirit can come. So what spirit is in us? Holy. What, what, okay. So what are we? Holy. How can we be holy? Because the Holy Spirit's in it. You getting this? It's living in the spirit, not the flesh. Now look at 17. And if you call on the Father who, without, who's not a respecter of persons, judge it, judge it, According to every man's work, past the time of your sojourning in fear. I'm going to put this in the Amplified, and then we're going to go to Acts 2. And I haven't planned any of this at all, no notes. Just want to put this message out, impart to you some, some, some wisdom. 1 Peter 1, verse 17. And if you call upon him as your father... We're talking about God. Who judges each one impartially according to what he does. So who do we call upon? You two? Joe? Mary? Sue? No, we call upon God, right? Who does what? Impartially judges. So who judges? God. And how does he do it? Impartially. Then. See, now, there's always a then. Have you noticed that? If you do this, I'll do that. If You know, if you want to be blessed in the city and blessed in the field, then well, you must hearken to my voice and deed my parents. That's how it always is. With God. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, then. You see where I'm going with that? So here's the then. And we're still in 17. You should conduct yourself with true reverence. Man, this is powerful. I, I didn't plan this. Throughout the time of your temporary residence on the earth, whether long or short. Some people are going to have a long life. Some people are going to have a shorter life. But however life you give, like I said, every day is a gift. You need to do it how? As you call upon God, knowing that he's your ultimate judge. You need to conduct yourself with true reverence. Uh, you must, in 18 it says, you must know. Or, or recognize. This is a powerful word. I pray, Lord God. See, it, it's the anointing. All I can do is put out the word. This word of God, I want you to know it's alive. It's a two edged sword. It can cut right into your soul. Convict and change and encourage and give you hope. It's living. It's, it's Jesus. Jesus is the word. He's talking to you right now. I'm just a man. I'm a messenger. I'm just, re all I'm doing is reading his word. I know that his word is a lie. It's a two-edged sword. So I'm putting it out. The Bible says part of our armor is the two-edged sword, right? Well, I'm using it today. Why? To give you hope. You must know and recognize that you are re redeemed or ransomed. Watch this. From the useless or fruitless way of living. Inherited by your tradition from your forefathers. Not with corruptible things such as silver and gold. That's not how you were purchased. You were purchased by an incorruptible seed. And his name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the anointed Messiah. 19. But you were purchased with the precious blood of Christ, the Messiah. Like that of a sacrificial lamb without blemish or spot. See, that's how in the Old Testament they used to have to do these sacrifices. It had to be this, uh, it had to be a perfect lamb. You know, every year, you know how hard it'd be to find a lamb without a spot or a blemish? They had to do that constantly. Jesus only had to do it one time. 
in Hebrews. It says he went into the holies of holies, not made by man, one time and for all, and, and shed his blood. And his blood hit that mercy seat. Where's the mercy? Well, it's right here. It's right here today. You found mercy. God going to give you some mercy today. Because we're talking about the blood of Jesus now. In 20, it says, it is true that he was chosen and foreordained before the foundation of the world. So he knew this was his destiny. But he was brought out to public view and made manifest in these last days at the end of the times for the sake of you. He died for you. Through him you believe in God. How do you believe in God? Through Jesus. Who raised him up from the dead. Who raised up Jesus from the dead? God. And gave him honor and glory. Remember that word doxa? Glory. So that your faith. Listen to me. Your faith. Forget about me. Forget about the distractions. Forget about everybody running around your house. Forget about all the things in your mind that you're worried and concerned about. Let's talk about you today and your faith and your hope. They are centered and rest in God. Your faith and hope right now should be resting in God. And what is God capable of? Rising people from the dead. Since by your obedience to the truth. There's a spirit of truth. You know that? Do what? The Holy Spirit. You have purified your hearts. Lord, purify our hearts today. Purify our hearts. Pure all of us. All of us. For all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. There was none righteous. No, not one. For you have purified your hearts for the sincere affection of the brethren. See that you. Oh, man, now I know this. Stop it! Now I know we're about ready to go deep. Here comes the distractions and jets and dogs barking. And you stop it. This is just silly, man. We're about ready to get to the blood of Jesus. But let's press on. Can we just press on? Uh, Lord help us. This is where we're at today. On YouTube and in life and in your home and on your jobs. Wherever you may be at today, this is what's happening. Since by your obedience to, to the truth, through the Holy Spirit, you have purified your hearts for the sincere affection of the brethren. In other words, that you should truly love the brothers and sisters in Christ. Not fakely or falsely or pretend to. But I'm going to put a link to this. I'm going to put a link to 1 Peter 1. Because God gave me this in both the Amplified Greek and the King James 1611 both. So you can compare them side by side. I want you to truly study this 21 and 22. You must see that you love one another fervently from a pure heart. I ask you, are we doing that? Are we loving one another fervently with a pure heart? Are we, have, as, as, have we asked God through our obedience to the spirit of truth to purify our hearts for a sincere, uh, so that we can have a sincere affection of the brothers and sisters in Christ? So that we can love each other, all of us, not pick and choose certain people, but that we can love each other with a pure heart and do it fervently. Let's look up the word fervently because you know what? Nothing's hidden from God. If we're not doing this, he knows. So don't claim to do it if you're not. Let's look up fervently because this is something I'm going to work on. I'll make sure I got it right. I don't know about anybody else. I'm going to make sure I got it right. Fervently is uh, having or showing great emotion or zeal. Great emotion or zeal. Man, I wish I could go in. I may be able to go into what the word zeal means. Uh, it was just in my class I'm taking yesterday. Let me see if I can find the, the Greek word for zeal. We're going to go to uh, this lesson. I'm taking this 12 week course. And... Anyway, uh, I'll just look up the word zeal in Greek. Look at this thing. 
We need to le love each other with zeal. Let's look up zeal in Greek. I should know this. It was on the test. American Heritage Seal is enthusiastic devotion to a cause, ideal, or goal, and tireless diligence to its further with passion. The Greek, uh, the Greek word is zealous. I don't really like this page. That's weird. So let's press on. Let me get rid of this page too. Let's press on with this powerful scripture. 23 says, You have been regenerated or born again, not from a mortal origin. In other words, not from a, a natural seed of, you know, it says, actually it says the word sperm. You weren't, you weren't born again by natural origin of, uh, uh, a sperm and an egg. Does that make sense? It's a supernatural. I'm going to close this door. Hold on. This. See, that's my neighbor's dog, Dark. It's not mine. I'm going to press through this. We got some serious spiritual warfare going on. To me, that's a good thing. That means I'm on the right track, not the wrong one. You have been regenerated, verse 23, born again, not from a mortal origin or seed or sperm, but from one that is immortally by the ever-living and lasting word of God. For all flesh, all mankind, I'm going to push through and do this. Is like grass. In all its glory and honor, like the flower of the grass, withers and the flower is dropped off. In other words, it dies. The natural always dies. But the word of the Lord, and this is what the word of the Lord is. In the original Greek, the New Testament was written in the original Greek. This is, look how good my dog is. It was their neighbor's dog. I'm going to show you why. It's not my dog. It was the, 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 my neighbor. He said, now he's got a second dog. Praise God. <laughs> I just wanted to show you it wasn't my dog. It was my neighbor's dog. But the word of the Lord. This is what the word of the Lord is. Divine instruction. Divine instruction. Or the gospel. Endures forever. I'm going to say that again. I'm excited. The word of the God, Lord endures forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. And, and then he goes on to write Second Peter. Which uh, is a topic for another day. But I just want to tell you, that's a powerful, uh, a powerful letter to be written by someone who denied Jesus three times, who didn't have enough faith to stay afloat on the water, who was rebuked and said, get behind me, Satan. See, we're hard on each other, aren't we? That's why we should operate in love and forgiveness, because you got to understand, as we make these videos, and I know I'm not perfect, and I know my videos aren't perfect, um, I'll never be perfect till that which is perfect has come. One thing I do is forgive and preach uh, unity and one accord in love and hope and tell you, you got hope too, a blessed assurance that you can call upon God right now and say, Father God, forgive me and cover me in the blood of Jesus and just instantly have protection. And if the devil's telling you otherwise, I'm here to expose that lie today. I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are, what your background is. I am telling you about a man who was real. It's not a historical fiction. 
Peter was a real person. I just gave you his whole background and family line and what he did for a living. He actually sat down with Jesus, saw him perform miracles, saw him raise the dead. Matter of fact, saw him, amen, thank you, Holy Spirit. Peter saw him heal his mother-in-law to where she was so sick she couldn't even get up. And instantly, next thing, he, she's preparing food for everybody. Peter saw all that. And, and still denied that he even knew Jesus. Not once, but three times. And through mercy and grace, not works. Through mercy and grace from a living God and a loving Savior. He inherited eternal life. He was allowed to see Jesus transfigured. And so it is with us. We're not perfect. We're forgiven of our sins. We can't get to heaven through works. If anybody, they don't like to hear that. Not by works, lest anyone should boast. Everybody knows that scripture. It's a gift of God. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close out with this, this, uh, this, this sermon. Jesus, uh, Peter gave about Jesus after he denied him three times to show you how you can go from glory to glory, from faith to faith. Because I, I, I don't want you to just leave from watching this having not learned anything. I want you to take away something from this that encourages you and edifies you and builds you up to tell you, fight on. What you're looking at right now, what you see in this camera, is not who I used to be. But it's also not the finished product. God isn't done with me down here yet. And certainly, and this is not what I'm going to be like in heaven. I am a work in progress. I am not who I used to be, and no one can accuse me of that. Because I'm changed. But God isn't done with me yet either. When I say this, I want you to understand, look, you're not who you used to be. And God isn't done with you yet either. So don't expect to be perfect. Just just realize God ain't done with you yet. But once he started with you, he's going to finish it. God, he will finish it. He will finish it. He's going to perfect you. He's going to take you from faith to faith. He said, I'm the author. See, it said every man or woman is granted a measure of faith. So he's the author, and he's the finisher of your faith. He's the alpha, the beginning, and he's the omega, the end. And if you let him, he's everything in between. So what you're looking at right now is an unfinished progress, a product, a work in progress, working my way to, to heaven, but, I, but, but not through anything that I can do. It says, okay... For by grace, now watch this, for by grace you've been saved. This is the word of God. Let me uh, make sure I get the right translation here. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you are saved. How are you saved? Through the law? No. For by grace you are saved. So, through faith. And it's not of yourselves. You can't save yourself. It is the gift of God. What's the gift of God? Your salvation. And how did you get it? Through faith. And how did you get the, the By grace. Not of works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And, not, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. Because if it was of works. Then Peter wouldn't, wouldn't have made it. Because he denied Christ three times. He wouldn't have made it. So so Peter was given grace and he and he and 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 Jesus even told him, Look, Peter, Satan desires to sift you like wheat. Remember that conversation that just popped in my head right now. But I prayed for you that your faith, what what? That what wouldn't fail? His strength, his armor, his great fishing skills. No, that is faith 
wouldn't fail. And then that when he returned, he would do what? Because to return meant he was going to leave the faith for a minute. You catch that? Now when he returned, he would strengthen the brethren. Now why do you think out of all the people, as I was praying this morning before I made this message and began to ponder Jesus, my Lord and Savior, my God, and Peter, and their relationship. Why do you think that it was Peter that has made this example? Because nothing in the Word of God is insignificant. Of denying Jesus three times. Do you think it's coincidental that it's the same one who said, if it, if it is you, bid me to come? Oh, well, come on out then. Come walk out on the water. And then when he sinked, could it possibly be, and there, there will be people that can't attack a revelation knowledge when, when the Holy Spirit and that Spirit of truth gives me revelation knowledge. There's nobody that can that, that can touch knowledge of God. Could I'm asking you this. Could it possibly be that Satan knew that Peter had radical faith? He had radical, I'll die for your faith. You can crucify me upside down faith. If that's you, I'll walk on water faith. Yeah, I may have slipped, but at least I got out of the boat and walked. Could it possibly be that Satan knew that? That Satan was studying Peter and he saw something about Peter. He, Man, this Peter, I got to stop him. He's got some radical faith that may just start a church that goes to the next 3,000 years. We got to stop this Peter. Every assignment, all hands on deck. We got someone who's literally willing to get out of the boat and walk on water. I'm going to set an assignment against this Peter. Is it possible that I just got that revelation knowledge from God this morning on my knees when I asked for a word from you that could not be refuted by man that God told me? Is it possible that God told me that that's what Jesus meant when he looked? Peter, Satan desires to sift you, Peter, like wheat. Why, Peter? Is it possible, I'm just asking you, is it possible that Satan had an assignment against Peter because he knew, he heard it, he was there in the dimension that Peter couldn't see, just like we can't see him. He's hearing this right now. Is it possible that that's why I come under such attack? Is because I got radical enough faith to say, get out of my way, you haters. I got people to reach to impart hope into them. A blessed hope and a blessed assurance that they can be saved by this grace and this blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Is it possible that Satan knew that? He would say, you are Peter, the rock. And on the, you, you've seen Jesus transfigured. On this rock, I'm going to build my church. That the gates of hell, notice they're gates. They're not spears and javelins. They're gates. The gates of hell won't prevail against this church that I'm going to build, Jesus said. And I'm going to use you to do it. I'm going to use you to do it. Matter of fact, it's going to get so tough for you because Satan wants to just run you through the wheat sifting machine that your faith is going to fail. And you're going to deny me three times, but I'm going to forgive you anyway because I'm going to use you. Is it possible that that is why? He was able to walk out on the water because he had some kind of radical, I love Jesus with everything. I left my uh, family and everything and my whole fishing business and everything to follow this man. and became. Gee, he, when he said, You're, I'm going to follow me, I'm going to make you fishers of men, that he believed in this. Is it possible that when he laid his eyes on Jesus, he instantly knew that this was the Messiah that was going to take away the sins of the world forever? Forever. Forever. And he just left everything and followed him. And Satan was there and he saw and said, we got to stop this, Peter. we got to bring every temptation there is to Peter. we got to put our resources on Peter because he's got some radical faith, man. He's getting out of the boat. He's walking on water. He's cutting the sword off of people. He's a radical. Is it possible? That he was under demonic attack. And we just don't read about it.
I'm under demonic attack. But I plead the blood of Jesus and they have to go. Is it possible that I know who I am in Christ Jesus? Is it possible that that's because of the blood of Jesus and mercy and grace? Is it possible that I could have the same radical faith Peter did? I'm just asking you. Did faith change from the early church to now? Is it possible that the reason you, where I'm going with this, is it possible is that the reason you keep getting discouraged and depressed and down and your own worst critic and so hard on yourself and thinking that you can't do it, is it possible it's because that there's been an assignment put against you that it's time for you to realize who you are in Christ Jesus and get out on the boat and start walking. Use that radical faith that you've been given through grace. Let's read it again. Whoever this is for, I want to speak directly to. It's by grace, which means unmerited favor. It's the favor of God resting upon your whole life. You don't know how you've even made it this far in, into this year. You don't even, you can't explain how you're even still alive, let alone loved by God. Maybe sometimes you don't even feel loved by God, but it is by possible, but, but by through this unmerited favor of God that just follows you around like a cloud, his glory cloud. Is it possible that this grace that you are saved is through your faith? That you have more faith that you're giving yourself credit for. It's not of yourself that that faith is a gift of God. Is it possible that you have a gift of faith? Is that possible that it's time for you to start using it? To walk on water. To perform miracle signs and wonders. People say, oh, he's getting off on that Pentecostal weirdness stuff. Well, and didn't Jesus say, don't be amazed at these things you see me doing? Well, what did Jesus do? He, he raised Lazarus from the dead. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. He, she had a fever back then. They didn't have Tylenol or Motrin. He, he healed the blind. He cast out legion. And then he says, don't be amazed at what I did because greater things than this shall you do. And in, in the Gospel of Mark, it says, and these signs shall follow who? Them that believe. Is it possible that we can have a faith so radical that even 2,000 years later, we're still doing the works that Jesus did? I'm just asking you, is that possible or did all that just die? If all that just died, then what would be the point of the church today? There'd be no casting out of demons. There, there, the demons would just be running us over. We'd all be full of demons. There'd be no power to cast them out. Is it possible that you could lay hands on the sick and they would recover? Is it possible that that's you and you just haven't accepted it yet? Well, according to Jesus and the word of God, which is a lie to this day, it is. Let's go to when when they confronted this Peter, this this water walking Peter, this cut off the ear Peter, this rebellious Peter who denied Jesus three times. Aren't you the one that was hanging around with that Jesus guy? No, you got the wrong guy. Oh, no, wait, wait, certainly you are. You're the one. You're one of them. We saw you with them. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I wasn't with them. I never knew him. I never knew Jesus. He said three times, cock crows. Is it possible that he didn't, did do the biggest repentance of his life knowing exactly who Jesus was and that he just did exactly what Jesus prophesied he would say? Is there a, uh, is there a point in time where Peter comes into such repentance from denying the Savior that we don't understand what he went through? It's not recorded. He's grieving. He's left his family. Hallelujah. He's, he's left his business. He's left everything. To follow this Jesus that renamed him and believed in him and trusted him and fed him and looked him in the eye and said, follow me. Is it possible that he spent a period of, of repentance that we, that we will never know until we get to heaven? Is it possible that it's time for us to begin this same repentance? 
Is it possible that maybe at times we've denied Christ or we've became unholy or we've said the wrong things or hurt people? Is it possible that maybe it's time that the reason that Jesus Christ is tarrying because it's time for us to get into that same state of repentance of denying Jesus Christ of Nazareth? And really getting into entering into a true relationship with him. A relationship that says, I don't I'm not even worthy enough. You don't understand this Jesus. He's coming back again. He's full of mercy and grace and love. And he saved me. And he changed my life. And I'm not even worthy to die the way he did. Matter of fact, crucify me upside down. Is it possible? That you are a sent man or woman. Research that. To take this radical Peter type of faith. That's a gift of God. Lest anyone should boast that they're anything. God is no respecter of persons. Is it possible that God has gifted you with this radical I'm out of the boat y'all type of faith. To go walk on that water. Is it possible that we are entering a period of repentance. So we can go out and, and win that final harvest of souls before the return of Jesus Christ is it possible that that day is upon us let's see in Acts 2 it says and when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were all what in one accord in one place and there came a sound of a mighty rushing wind and it filled the house I want you to know that this first it was a sound and it came from heaven it says and it was a mighty rushing wind. They knew it was there. Windows were blowing open. And it filled the entire house. And then these cloven tongues of fire. It just sat upon all of them. None were excluded from this radical thing. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues. Now note this. They didn't do it till the Spirit gave them utterance. It's not when you it's not what you speak, it's the spirit speaking through you. Get a hold of that. It's when the spirit gives you utterance, that unction, that 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 unction for you to begin to speak. That's how you speak in tongues. Not with your own mouth. It's the spirit seek, uh, speaking through you. Is it possible that you can receive that? Yes. That question's asked on YouTube all the time. It, it's it's not going to be something you have to beg for. It's a free gift. You're not going to get it on YouTube. Man, you can go, go, go find an altar. Go get your hands laid on you. Stop thinking that you're not good enough for it. It fell upon all of them. It's a free gift for all. You are not excluded from this gift. Matter of fact, you're going to need it in these end times. I, I, I wish I could have like all of you in front of me right now. and We could all just begin to pray and have it fall down upon us right now. Because this is what the, the power of the Holy Ghost can do to someone who denied Christ three times. They all surrounded him and began to mock him. In uh, Acts 2.13, they said, these men are full of new wine. No, they're drunk. Now watch, this Peter, the Peter that went through a state of repentance after denying Christ three times. He stood up. I want you to take note that he stands up. And he lifts up his voice and he says, look, you men of Judea. He's not playing here now. He's just been baptized in the power, the dunamis, Holy Ghost, that creates miracles, the greater works that Jesus Christ said he can do. He has now received that and so can you. And now he's about ready to speak with the, as the Holy Ghost gives him utterance, just like when we're taken into custody or whatever may happen that that same power that tells in us will begin to utter exactly we will just rise up and begin to speak with the oracles of God as the Holy Ghost gives us utterance this day it's the same Holy Ghost it's not a different version of it or a watered down version of it the same Holy Ghost they got is the same Holy Ghost we got the same utterance they use is the same utterance we use and this is what he says he said, this is that. Hallelujah. This is that. This what you're seeing right here isn't drunk people. This is that. Do you understand that? This is that which was prophesied about by the prophet Joel. This is that. What do you mean, Peter? This is that which was prophesied on what you're seeing right here. 
What you're seeing, this display of dunamis power, is that which was prophesied by Joel in the books you've been studying all your life. This is that power. And it shall come to pass in the last days, said God. I will pour out my spirit on what? All flesh. And you, now watch this. People said, remember how I told you in part one that I'm going to prove that it's for men of all ages? There's no ages that are left out of this. Men and women of all ages. Look, it says, and your sons and daughters. Not just you. All flesh and your sons and daughters are mentioned in here. Well, what are they going to do? Are they just going to speak in tongues? I want you to take note of this. I'm taking a class on this. Are they just going to speak in tongues in the last day? Is that what it says in Acts 2.17? It says, no, the, the all flesh and the sons and daughters are going to what? They're going to prophesy. This is that power that's going to give them all the power to prophesy. And you think that people can't prophesy today? And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, he's just laying it all out. Look, all of us, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall what? Speak in tongues? No, they shall prophesy. They shall prophesy. Who? All of them. Even the children. Even the sons and daughters. Even the maidservants. And I will show wonders in heavens above, and signs in the earth beneath, and blood and fire and vapors of smoke. Surely this is going to happen. 21, it says, and it shall come to pass. In other words, I guarantee you this is going to happen. That whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now he's just quoting the prophet now, but now he's going to break them off with the dunamis power. This Peter who denied, this Peter who I've been talking about for two hours, who denied Jesus three times that we talk about and laugh about for him, Falling in the water and denying Jesus and pulling his sword and all that. Let's see the, what the Holy Ghost does with Peter here. Remember, it's not Peter talking. It's the Holy Ghost giving him utterance. Ye men of Israel. You realize that these people could kill him? He don't care. Look, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and signs and wonders, which God did by him. God did it in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. In other words, you saw it. Don't deny it. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel. And God knew it, it says. You have taken. And the wicked hands have crucified and slain this Jesus. He's saying this is that. And 24 said, but whom God has raised up and having loosed the pains of death. There, he took the sting out of death for you. Because it was not possible that he should be holding them. The grave, everybody say, the grave couldn't hold my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For David, and then he talks about David. See, he's letting them know exactly what's happening. This ain't, we ain't drunk. David even spoke concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Fight on, saints. This is the message today. Fight on. I don't know what lie they're telling you or who's against you or what's coming against you. You are to fight on because Jesus Christ is at your right hand. And you have the, the power of the Holy Ghost. And in 26 it says, Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. He's talking about uh, what a David is saying. Now go down to 29. It says, men and brethren. Notice he separates the brethren as the brothers and sisters in Christ. Notice how he says, okay, okay, brothers and sisters in Christ and everybody else in, in, in 29. Let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is still with us to this day. In other words, we can go find his tomb, and his bones are in it. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loans, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. See to David. You ever heard of that? He's, he, he's seeing 
this before spake of the resurrection of Christ. David spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus, this is what he's talking about. This, this, this denying, this, 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 this hatred and evil accusations that come upon us by others. Jesus doesn't look at you that way. I want you to know that Jesus doesn't look at you this way. This Jesus, verse 32, Acts 2 says, hath God raised up where we were all witnesses. We saw it. You can't deny it. We saw it. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted and having received of the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost. This is why what we're what you're seeing is we ain't drunk, man. I'm getting holy bumps all over the place. We ain't drunk. We're about ready to prophesy. All of us, with because this is that, and it's gonna go for all of time. What Jesus did, God rose him up, and we're witnesses to that. And having received the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost. He has shed for this, which you now see in here. What you're seeing in 33, underline that, 33, the age uh, of Christ when he died, 33. What you see in here right now was all prophesied by Joel, and it was, it was spoken of by David the patriarch, that you can go lay a hand on his tomb right now. This is what you're seeing. For David is not ascended into the heaven, but he said it himself. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made the, the same Jesus, this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. In other words, the one you killed is the anointed Messiah. He gave us this power. The one you had, the one you saw doing miracles and stuff, he gave us this power. And I want it to be very clear that this is not Peter talking. This is Peter talking with the power that the anointed Messiah came, that David, and the patriarch David that you love so much, and Joel, the prophets you read about in your synagogue. This is the power. This is that that they spoke of. It ain't new wine. It ain't us drunk. This is a promise unto us and to your children in 39 and to all that are afar off and as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. And then they, now watch this in 41. It didn't end with his big sermon there to the, all these people. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them 3,000 souls. You want to talk about a soul winning sermon. 3,000 souls. You know how many people probably lived back then? It certainly wasn't 7 billion. It probably wasn't even 1 billion. You know what I mean? It wasn't even close to a billion. 3,000 souls from that powerful Holy Ghost speech from someone who denied Christ three times. Come on, somebody. So what did they, and, and they, and, but they didn't stop with these 3,000 souls. In 42 it says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and what? Fellowship. See, we're to fellowship with each other, not hate on each other. And in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by who? The apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. In other words, when they got full of the Holy Ghost, they were all in one accord. And they stayed in one accord. And they did everything in common. They sold all their possessions and good and parted them to all men. As everyone man needs. So if one person had too much, they sold it and they gave it to the one that didn't have enough. They had no lack. They were in perfect harmony and unity at that time of the world. What happened to our world? What happened to our church? And they continually, daily, with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So this Peter who denied Christ gave this, received this power of the Holy Ghost that was promised. And he gave this sermon that added 3,000 souls. And they went door to door with no lack, having unity and one accord and like-mindedness. And every day they added to the church. Just like Jesus said, 
you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm here to tell you that same faith exists today. It's time for us to get radical. It's time for us to get out of the boat. It's time to call upon God. And it's time for us to go door to door. And it's time for us to reach those souls. Because that same Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back very soon. I love you. Get that power. The fire.